Good morning and welcome to today's MPG Primer. We are very fortunate today to have our speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Adler, who is an associate research scientist at Yale, working in the group of Ruslan Meseltov at the Tannenbaum Center for Theoretical and Analytical Human Biology. Dr. Adler completed her graduate work at the Wiseman Institute and was previously a postdoc at Broad. She is also a recipient of the Israel National Postdoctoral Award Program for Advancing Women in Science. Her work in tissue level systems biology focuses on discovering the basis of communication among cell types in diverse tissue processes using a combination of mathematical models, computational data analysis, and optimization theory. And we're, we're so excited to hear about your work, Mary, and so please get started when you like. Um, I will just mention to the audience also that Mary has kindly agreed to take questions at any point. So if you will please post those in the Q&A, Sarah is, is ready to voice those as soon as they arise. So thank you and, and please get started, Mary. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Um, so today I will talk about emergence of division of labor and tissues through cell interactions and spatial cues. Okay, so before I start, I really want to acknowledge the group of people that worked on this project. It was a collaborative effort. Um, so my two mentors, Ruslan Nejitov and Aviv Regev, and our collaborators, Noam Oriel and Mornitsan from the Hebrew University, uh, as well as Alex Gueva from the Broad. Okay, so I'll start. Okay, so if you think of single cell gene expression data, we often see that cells form certain structure or certain patterns in gene expression space. So here in these plots, for example, every point represents an individual cell in the high dimensional gene expression space. And often we see certain patterns here. I just put some example that we often see in real data, such as clusters uh, or a certain pattern that shows a trajectory and even a continuum of expression for cells that are of the same type. But the origin of such patterns is usually unclear. So one theory that addresses this is the Pareto optimality theory. This is a theory that was previously developed in the lab of Uri Alon at the Weizmann Institute, where I did my PhD. Um, and in this theory we, theory, we think of the cells as multitaskers that need to perform multiple tasks for the tissue they reside in. And when cells perform these tasks, usually they face a trade-off, meaning that they cannot perform all of the tasks simultaneously in the best way. So for example, you can think of a certain cell, like this red cell, that has a certain gene expression profile, which is optimized for a certain task, uh, a red task, so it will have maximal performance in this task. And this will come at the expense of performing other functions that require a different gene expression profile. And so when you have this trade-off, we can use the Pareto optimality theory to tell us how to, how to optimally trade off these different tasks. And so the prediction according to this theory is that cells should fall within low dimensional polytopes or pointed shapes, where the number of vertices correspond to the number of tasks that they trade off. So if there are two tasks, with a trade-off that would fall within a line, three tasks, a triangle, four tasks, tetrahedron, and so on. So here in this plot, again, every point represents an individual cell in gene expression space. And the cells that are closest to the vertices are specialty cells. They specialize at each task, or also we call them archetypes. And cells that are in the middle are generally cells that perform all tasks with some weight. And so uh, the set of all points within this uh, shape, within these polytopes, uh, are called the Pareto front. This is the set of points that optimally trade off the different tasks. And again, just to emphasize, every point that is outside this shape is suboptimal. So there will always be uh, a point within the triangle that perform the three tasks uh, better. Uh, please stop me if you have uh, any questions to ask. Okay, so when we think of cells in a tissue constant, we, context, we know that cells are not individualist. It's not that every cell uh, needs to, to be optimal on its own, but rather that cells collectively perform functions for the tissue that they reside in. So the question is, how can cell decide whether to become especially cells or generally cells? Somehow cells need to uh, self-organize to understand how to govern and their specialization, and there has to be some kind of a mechanism that underlies their behavior. So we can think of at least two central mechanisms that govern the behavior of the way that cells divide labor. Cells can either be guided by an external gradient or an external condition in the tissue, for example, a gradient of oxygen in the tissue, 
that depending on the level of ox oxygen, they will uh, perform different functions, or they can use cell-cell interactions and influence each other to perform different uh, functions. And the question, given these two mechanisms, what would be the optimal distribution in the way that cells specialize in the different functions? For example, do we expect to see a continuum of specializations where we have both generalist and specialist cells within a cell type population? Or do we expect cells to, to show only specialist groups? And the second question is, what would be the corresponding mapping to the way that these cells are organized in the tissue space? Okay, we, for example, we can consider for every such specialization, different way that the cells can be organized with respect to each other in the tissue space. So in, in the case of external gradient, this is something that we previously showed. Um, if cells are guided by an external factor that influences the, their performance, if you take this into the theory, the period optimality theory, it shows that uh, the expectation is that cells will show a continuum of specialization. So we would get that cells are both specialists and generalists. And in a tissue space, the different archetype, the specialist cells in the different functions will be located in distinct position in the tissue where the condition is best to perform their functions. So we showed that, that this is the case, for example, for intestinal uh, enterocytes. These are cells that line the intestinal villus and are at the presence of a gradient of oxygen. So at the bottom of the uh, villus, there is high level of oxygen. As you go up the villus, there is lower amount of oxygen. If you examine single cell gene expression data of uh, individual enterocytes, this is what you can see here. Every point is a single enterocyte projected on the first two principal components in gene expression space. We find that the cells form a continuum of expression, a one-dimensional curve, well, which is bounded within a triangle, suggesting that they trade off between three major tasks. And, and you can see here the, the different tasks they trade off. And the cells here are colored based on their spatial position along this villus axis. So red cells come from the top of the villi, blue cells come, come from the bottom. So what you can see is, as the theory predicts, the different specialist cells are located in distinct position along the villi where the performance is highest, depending on the level of oxygen. So this is the case for cells that are guided by an external uh, smooth gradient in the, in the tissue. And the question is, what would be the optimal allocation, task allocation, if cells are not guided by an external gradient, but rather use cell-cell interactions to regulate their performance? So to address this, we developed a theory, a, a mathematical theory, where we consider cells in a tissue context that need to perform multiple tasks that have a trade-off, and we assume that each cell is influenced by what its neighbor cells are performing. So for example, we can consider a situation where certain cells are performing a certain function very well. They will communicate this to their neighbor cells, telling their, the, the neighbor cells, okay, so you don't need to do the same function, you can do other functions instead. So this is the case of lateral inhibition, where cells inhibit each other to perform different functions. So uh, the way that we model it, we consider this total performance function, which is a product over all the tasks that the cells need to perform for the, for the tissue. And the contribution to every task is a sum over all the cells. So cells, cells collectively perform these functions. Every cell uh, contributes based on its gene expression profile. It has a certain performance function based on its gene expression profile. And it also has this term, this HT, this is the interaction term. This is the effect on a certain cell's performance according to its nearby cells, what the nearby cells are performing. And then what we are asking is what would be the gene expression profile of all the cells in the simulation that will maximize this function? So a very important uh, parameter in this model is the range of interaction. We consider either short range interaction where only nearest neighbors affect each other or long range interaction where more and more cells can influence each other. So here are the results of our simulations. Uh, what you can see here is that we assume in our simulation that cells reside in a two dimensional grid in a tissue space and that they need to perform three major tasks that have a trade-off. And so in principle, they should be confined in gene expression space to a triangle. And going from left to right, we change the range of interaction. So considering either short range interaction and long, longer range of interaction. At the top row, you can see the optimal uh, 
um, distribution of the cells in gene expression space in the in their performance, their specializations. And at the bottom, you can see the arrangement of the cells in the tissue space where they are colored based on their specializations. Okay, so if there are no interaction at all, we start here in the left side. Um, we don't have any, uh, we don't introduce interaction term in the model. Cells do not influence each other. The solution is symmetric. All cells will have the same gene expression profile. They will all ex are expected to be, in this case, generalists in the middle of this uh, triangle. When we introduce interaction, where nearest neighbors influence each other to perform different functions, we get a salt and pepper pattern, where indeed nearest neighbors perform different functions. And this means in gene expression space that cells are pushed to the circumference of uh, the triangle in this case. What is interesting is that as we increase the range of interaction, where more and more cells affect each other, we see that more and more cells are expected also to be generalists until we, we see a full continuum of specialization between specialist and generalist cells. And in the tissue space, we see different phases of different um, spatial patterns that emerge, including stripes and islets of the different specialist cells. So looking at this variety of patterns that can emerge when cells uh, communicate their specialization to each other, we wanted to compare it back to the external gradient scenario. So what we can see is that with both scenarios, with external gradient that influence the cells in the tissue, and also with cell-cell interactions, the uh, expected gene expression profile is very similar. In both scenarios, cells are expected to show a continuum of specialization. However, the distribution or the pattern in the tissue space is very distinct. With external gradients, the different archetypes, different specialty cells, are located in distinct positions. As we already mentioned, this is where the condition in the tissue is best to perform uh, all the different functions. However, with cell-cell interactions, the different archetypes are actually expected to be close to each other. This is where they highly influence each other to perform different functions. And we can quantitatively define this difference by measuring the pairwise distance of every pair of cells in the physical space, in the tissue space, versus expression distance. So here, every circle, uh, the size of the circle represents the number of pairs in every such beam. So you can see that with external gradients, there is a correlation indicating that cells that are far in expression space, which are the archetypes, so they are the furthest from each other in expression space, are also expected to be far from each other in physical space. But with cell-cell interactions and specifically lateral inhibition, the archetypes are actually expected to be close to each other and we lose this correlation. So using this theoretical framework, now we have potentially a way when we look at real data to infer from the pattern that we see in the data, what is the underlying mechanism that govern the way that cells divide labor? So to test this on, on real data, we considered fibroblast uh, population. Uh, these are cells that are found in most mammalian tissues. They are very important for the tissue and also known to be multitaskers. So they produce and remodel the extracellular matrix, provide structural support, regulate the immune response, are very important in response to injury, facilitating wound healing and tissue repair, and are also important in order to maintain homeostasis and proper tissue composition. We also know that fibroblasts uh, can produce many types of signals, including growth factors, hormone, chemokines, that influence other cell types in the tissue and also influence their own uh, behavior. And so uh, fibroblasts are a great candidate to test this theory to see whether they indeed use interactions within the fibroblast population to take on different specializations. And so to, to test this theory on fibroblast, we examined uh, spatial transatomic data of the colon fibroblast. These are experiments, Leipzig experiments that were led by Mbala Ram Davidi at the Broad. Here you can see uh, an example of a slide taken from the mouse colon tissue and with the different cell types that were annotated to the different beads in this uh, slide. And for the sake of, of, of our project, we focused on the fibroblast population of cells that are here marked in red. So here is how the data looks like. Here, what I'm showing is the fibroblast population of cells from these slide-seek uh, data. Every point represents a bead of fibroblasts projected on the first two principal components in engine expression space. What you can see is that although these, these are all fibroblasts, the same cell type, still we see a continuum of, of expression profile 
and that fits very well within a triangle. So in order to infer what are the three tasks that fibroblasts specialize in, we ask what are the genes that are enriched, highly expressed near each one of the vertices. So for example, you can see here a collagen gene called 3A1 that you can see its expression in these, so these are the same cells. Uh, it has higher expression as you go towards the blue archetype. So this allows us to conclude what is the specialization of each one of the archetypes. So we find that fibroblasts um, in this data show a specialization of ECM production, including collagen, contractile functions, and regulation of immune response. So, to, so for each one of these uh, specializations, we found a set of genes that were enriched near these uh, vertices. So since this is spatial transcriptomic data, we're able to look at the way that these cells are arranged in the tissue space. When we look at the uh, slide, slide of the tissue slide, and zooming in, what you can see is that we don't see a pattern where we have specific regions in the tissue uh, of certain archetypes, but we see a mixture of archetypes. And we use our pairwise distance method to quantitatively uh, define this. And we, indeed, we see that there is no correlation. And in fact, archetypes that are far in expression space tend to be close to each other in the tissue space. So first of all, looking at these patterns, we can uh, see that fibroblasts do not have a pattern that agrees with an external gradient in the tissue. And in order to further test whether they indeed use cell-cell interactions to take on these different uh, functions, the next thing I wanted to ask is whether we see that indeed the specialist fibroblast cells interact with each other. So to do that, we're looking for a situation where there is a ligand that is highly expressed in cells that are closest to one archetype, for example, and its corresponding receptor is highly expressed in another archetype, uh, indicating that these two archetypes potentially interact with each other. So in order to perform this ligand receptor mapping between the different specialist cells, we analyzed uh, single cell RNA sequencing data of the same cell type population of colon fibroblasts. Here, every point represents an individual fibroblast last projected on the first three principal components in gene expression space, we find that they fit very well within a five vertex simplex, and we could also infer the five major tasks that they trade off uh, in this data set. And then we, we perform the ligand receptor mapping in the following way. So for example, we find that BMP7, a signal that is secreted by cells, highly expressed in cells that are close to archetype number two, its corresponding receptor is expressed in cells that are close to archetype number five. And so we draw an edge between these two archetypes, indicating that they interact with each other. So we do that for all the ligand receptor pair that we found to be enriched in this data set, allowing us to build this archetype crosstalk network. In this network, every node represents an archetype within the fibroblast population. And edges between the nodes represents ligand receptor enrichment between the two corresponding archetypes. So what we can see is that, first of all, we find a lot of crosstalk between every pair of archetypes within the fibroblast populations. And secondly, and most interestingly, using this analysis, we found an interesting interaction between two of the archetypes, the blue and the red, so the archetype for ECM production and the contractile uh, function archetype, that interact, potentially interact with each other through delta and notch. Now, delta notch is a, a pair of ligand receptor that is part of a very well studied um, signaling pathway that is conduct dependent. So cells that are in contact with each other um, can produce this um, double negative feedback through delta notch that provides lateral inhibition where one cell uh, uh, expresses delta and the adjacent cells notch, delta notch, and so on. And this is exactly the situation that we started in our simulation to, to consider lateral inhibition. So in order to uh, now test whether indeed these um, delta producing cells and the notch producing cells are close to each other, since this is a contact dependent interaction, we map the uh, expression of delta and notch back to this uh, slide sick data. Here you can see the cells where we zoom in an uh, example of one slide. Here they are colored based on their specialization, the different archetypes, and here they are colored based on the ratio between the delta and notch expression. And you can see that the delta and, and notch expressing cells form a boundary in the tissue space and are found in, in proximity to each other. And so using this approach, I showed you how we use both spatial transcriptomic data and single cell data to infer how cells within the same cell type population divide labor using potentially using interaction. 
So what if we don't have spatial information about cells? then single cell uh, RNA sequencing data is, is much more uh, prevalent. We can also use our framework to say something if we don't have spatial information. We show this, we demonstrate this for lung, fibroblast, and macrophages. So for these two population of cells, we first examined their uh, tasks, their specializations. Here you can see these two cell type population in gene expression space. We find that uh, fibroblasts from the lung, similarly to fibroblasts from the colon, show a trade-off between five major functions of fibroblasts and are found within a five uh, vertex simplex. And macrophages are found to fit very well within a tetrahedron, showing a trade-off between four major tasks uh, of, of macrophages in the lung. And so we used our approach to map ligand receptor interaction between the different specialized cells to build archetype cross-tech networks for these two populations of cells. So here, again, every node here represents an archetype from the lung fibroblast population. Here, every node represents archetypes from the macrophage population in the lung. And in the edges between them are based on enrichment of ligand and receptor pairs between the different archetypes. And you can see that there is a lot of crosstalk where the different archetypes interact with each other. Now, when we compare these patterns of interaction to intestinal enterocytes that I showed you in the beginning of my talk, that we know these cells are um, governed by an external gradient, oxygen gradient among the tissue. When we do the same, when we build this arctic cross network for the three archetypes for intestinal enterocytes, indeed we see that the interaction is limited to archetypes that are close to each other in the tissue space. And we do not see that uh, archetypes that are far from each other interact with each other. So this shows that we can use this approach of building archetype cross talk network to say something about the arrangement, the spatial arrangement of the archetypes with respect to each other, and to say something about whether uh, they use cell interactions or something that is more uh, smooth um, and external uh, to the cells in the tissue. So to summarize, I showed you a theoretical framework of how uh, cells divide labor using two central mechanisms either being guided by an external gradient, superimposed gradient they, so that cells cannot change, or using feedback interaction within the cells when they self-organize to take on different um, uh, specializations on demand. And using this theory, when we look now at real complex data, we can uh, perhaps disentangle and infer uh, what is the underlying mechanism that govern the behavior of the cell. So with that, I would like to thank again our uh, collaborators from the Broad Institute and outside the Broad. Uh, I want to thank uh, my funding and, and thanks again for this invitation. And I'll be very happy to take questions if there are questions. Thanks so much, Mary, for a great talk. Um, it's so much data that, that you can use for this, but what's, I guess, the minimum scale, the smallest number of cells you need from a data set to be able to do this kind of or analysis. Right, yeah. So that's uh, a great question because uh, you really need to have statistical significance because so if you if you take it to the extreme, three cells are always a triangle, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah, so the more cells you have, the better. Um, so from experience, so what I showed you, um, the way that we find these shapes is, uh, is based on, it's an algorithm that uh, was developed in the lab of Uri Alon at the Weizmann Institute. It's called uh, PARTI, <laughs> P-A-R-T-I. Um, and so, yeah, the more points you have, the better. Um, usually we need um, a few hundreds or at least a thousand of, of cells in order to say something significant. Uh, but it really depends on the quality of the data. Yeah. And that's of each cell type that you need kind of the hundreds to thousands. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I realize I should say, if anyone has questions, feel free to post in the Q and A or raise your hand. Um, have you done this looking at cell states instead of cell types to try to ascribe some of these functions to the cell states that we're identifying um, in disease or or kind of physiologic tissues? Um, so you mean instead of focusing on a certain cell type? population to compare a certain cells, like a cell type in different cell states, physiological states? 
Yeah, sorry, I should explain better. Um, so like for cardiomyocytes, we'll often look and say, oh, these are the sick ones. These are the proliferating yeah. ones. These yeah. are the young ones. Yeah. Um, and it'd be, we kind of infer that based on gene expression and similarity to other experiments. Right. Um, yeah. But it would, this would be an amazing way to support those inferences about cell state. Yeah, so definitely um, we have been doing that. So I have another uh, project um, in parallel to that where I explore fibrosis, which is a disease of excessive scarring or an injury. So um, there we really see that fibroblasts, which is, uh, as you can see, my favorite type of cell, <laughs> um, <laughs> they become more of a, um, uh, so they show a phen phenotype of myofibroblast and they produce the scar and they um, interact with the immune system. Um, so, so we've compared fibroblasts from healthy tissues uh, with, and fibroblasts from uh, uh, fibrotic tissues in the lung and also in, in the heart. Um, and indeed we see, uh, so, so it's very interesting, right? Because you expect different things. We, you can either expect cells to uh, now shift to, to particular archetypes and not show all, all this specialization, or maybe they will take on a new archetype that didn't exist before. Um, and, and so we see for, for, I think every disease will show something else for fibrosis. We see that fir the fibroblasts tend to focus on, to concentrate on specific archetypes that are, uh, for some reason, more important now in the context of the disease and tend to deplete other archetypes. So, yeah, so this can be maybe an approach also to know how to, uh, shift the, right. The, the function of the cells. Yeah. More it, it's just cells. a very cool concept on top of cell state to think about kind of what's the collective new function that right. those cells might have. Right. Yeah. This is, is, this is Diane. Uh, this is super cool, Mary. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I, I um, I've previously thought a bit about um, the evolution of multicellularity, and it seems like there are some themes that emerge here that are, that are parallel to that in terms of the acquisition of new states. Of course, here it's a, a phenomenon of what the cell is doing rather than it's you know, it, it's uh, being specifically part of a different tissue. But I wonder if if you s see aspects of this model that could be applied to those evolutionary questions as well. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So we actually, so right now in the theory captures the kind of like the steady state solution, right? But it would be really cool to expand the theory to consider the way to get there, right? The, the like the, the trajectory to reach this up, up optimal solution. So you can start with some random point uh, somewhere in the space and to see how cells find this uh, optimal trade-off um, and whether they indeed find like, for example, the, the shortest path or not necessarily and how does this correspond to the evolutionary uh, yeah, trajectories. Yeah, this would be very interesting. Thanks. Oh, Ben has his hand raised. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and voice your question. Hi, that was a fascinating talk. I was just wondering, um, kind of hearing this for the first time, um, what are the limitations of this uh, model in terms of, are there shapes or kind of structures in single cell data that would um, not fit this uh, type of analysis? Yeah, so thanks uh, for the question. Um, so first of all, I think one limitation is that currently we're performing this analysis on uh, PCA on principal component analysis. And it's, as you know, single cell data is, is, is very noisy. So you may not capture the, the dimensionality of the data in, in, these, in this analysis. Um, the reason we, we do want to do the analysis in these axes is that we are looking for axes that ha have some uh, meaning with respect to the to gene expression level with respect to performance in different tasks. So if, but if you have idea on how, on, on other ways to reduce dimensionality and still keep this meaning, then I would be happy to discuss. So this is, I think, one limitation. Um, and, but we do have multiple steps in order to test whether we indeed see something that is real. So first of all, we feed the data to this simplex. Um, um, so we use uh, uh, some statistical methods and like a principal convex HAL analysis, for example. 
And then once we, let's say we, we think we have a certain shape, it, this is not enough. The next step is to look at the cells that are closest to, to each vertex and ask what are the genes that are expressed in these cells. We need to find uh, common functions for, for the genes that are highly expressed in these cells. So if you don't find anything, then again, we, we don't trust these results. But when we do and we see clear specialization in the different archetypes, then you know, this supports further supports this uh, analysis. Yeah, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> I, I work with data from cultured fibroblasts, and I'm now suddenly realizing that because we're getting bulk RNA data, we may in fact be summarizing across lots of <laughs> lots of right. cells doing very different things. Um, how much would you suggest I worry about that? And maybe it's not a worry if I'm trying to get aggregate population level data, but I have never thought about this <laughs> feature before. Right. So I guess it depends really on on what you're asking, right? For some, some questions, uh, uh, bulk data is very useful, much more robust, and really depends. Uh, if you need this granularity, right, of of uh, like of specialization, you want to, like what what I uh, discussed before, the fibrosis disease, where it's really important to understand which cells are the ones that produce the scar, which are the normal ones. So if you want to separate this, then yeah, this this could be useful because sometimes it's not you you won't see clear clusters in your data, you would really would see continuum. And then this framework is more useful. Thanks. And if someone wanted to try this approach on their own data, is this um, is your uh, pipeline posted on GitHub or elsewhere? Yeah, this is, these are all available. So, so the party algorithm can uh, take your data and fit it to a simplex and also give you the enrichment. So it gives you a table of the enriched genes for every archetype and also Go uh, terms. So it's very useful. Uh, it is implemented in Python, R, and MATLAB. Um, our new approach of um, creating this archetype crosstalk network is also uh, will be available. So we just the, the paper was just accepted. So once it's published, it will be available. But you can always email me and I'll be happy to share. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for your talk today um, and for sharing this uh, really exciting new way to add another level of um, analysis and understanding to, to single cell or single nuclear data. Thank you. Thank you for having me.